Good morning. Hey, um, I hate to do this. Uh, tech, could you bring the spot that's right on me down just a, just a smidge? We've been working on this because it looks so dark on the video. Uh, you can go up a little bit more. Perfect. I just want to be able to see faces up in the, up in the top, and I don't want to sweat. It's really good to see all of you today. We are two weeks into a three-week series, or this is our second week in. Last week, we talked about God's pursuit of us, God connecting with us, God wanting to be in relationship with us. And it starts in the garden when he created uh, Adam and Eve. And it, 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 if you look at the scriptures, if you take the broad stroke of the scriptures from creation to revelation, you see that, that God's relentless pursuit of humanity, and not just humanity as a whole, but you. And today we're going to talk, we're going to kind of bridge the gap. Next week we're going to talk about what our, what our consistorial goal for, for 2000, the ministry season of 2021-2022. Um, uh, and that is, that will be, we'll, we'll get specific next week, but it has to do with us and others. Uh, but this one is kind of that fulcrum, the seesaw message of, okay, if, if God pursues us, he has a desire for us to in turn pursue him. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first his righteousness. And, and that we're supposed to, 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 to walk toward God as God walks toward us. But we're also supposed to walk toward other people, one another, and not just other Christians, but other people in general. So this is, that, this is the day when we talk about both of those. And it is all encompassing, so I can't get to all of it, but I'm going to do my best to give you uh, some evidences from the Old Testament, Jesus' combination of those evidences in the New Testament, and explain a bit about the revolutionary work of Jesus when he was on this planet and that he continues the same revolutionary work today. We hear a lot about, around the world, about revolution. We hear a lot about transforma you know, transforming a country or transforming Western civilization or transforming this. Jesus was a revolutionary, but he did not topple governments. He, he, he flipped the world right side up. So he changed the world, not just a particular system of governance. He changed a world view, how we should see the world, because that's how God created it. So we're going to talk a bit about what he changed and what that means to us, how we participate in that today. So join me in prayer, and we'll get started. Almighty God, we bless you for who you are, and you, you tell us that you seek us. You tell us that we're the kind of worshipers you seek. You tell us, too, that, that you want us to remain in you to abide in you, to seek you as you seek us. Lord, this is not my message for them. This is your message for us. So if there's something that I'm going to say that isn't of you, I don't want to say it. But if there's something that you want said that I haven't thought of yet in prayer and study, I ask that you make it burn within me so that I know it's from you and I will speak your words to your people this day. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive what you would have us see, hear, and receive. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go back to some, some, uh, some passages. They're just individual verses, but we're going to go back to some passages that you may or may not go to very often. Um, there's a, a preacher in the last century, uh, but he used to talk about those, those passages, those, those, those books back in the Old Testament. He called them the sticky pages, because when you get a new Bible and you have that gilded stuff on the side, it's the, sometimes you have to break the guild apart. And Leviticus and Deuteronomy and some of those aren't, aren't the ones that we're often just flipping through looking for, looking for wisdom. So we're going to be in the sticky pages, but just a couple of verses. And the first one is this. It's what's known as the Shema. Uh, Ray Vanderlaan teaches all the students at Holland Christian High School. And any, anyone who ever goes on a, on a trip with Ray Vanderlaan to the Holy Land, he teaches them at least the first part of the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. <sighs> But what we don't necessarily realize is that the Jewish people, every day, were supposed to pray the Shema. Just like before every, uh, every festival, the opening prayer is that Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, bless you, Lord our God. Now notice that that's not asking God to bless us first, it's, it, it's blessing God. And the Shema, it reads like this in English, it says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, the Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your will. Or, I'm going from memory instead of reading the page. Let me get it right. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Now, we're very familiar with that. But notice that when the command comes to us, it first talks about God. It's here, Israel, listen, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Baruch atah Adonai Elohino. Bless you, Lord our God, King of the universe, are the next things that come. So often when we go to God, when we want to connect with God, often we go to God when we, want, when we try to connect with God by telling God first what we want, what we need, what our desires are, what our hurts are. But the, the pattern of Scripture, even when Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So one of the ways that God approaches us is he comes to us where we are. He refuses to leave us that way, but he, he joins us where we are. But one of the ways we connect with God is telling God who he is. That's what worship means. That's what we're doing here this morning. When we sing, we're telling God who he is. We're reminding ourselves of whose we are. When we hear from the scriptures, when, when the word of God is proclaimed from a pulpit or from you reading yourself, from reading a book, from listening to something online, if it is faithful to the scriptures, it is telling us about God first, and then it's telling us about us in relationship to God. So God, one of the, the things he wants, the people, and it's not for God's sake, it's for people's sake. One of the things he, listen up, people, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How do we set things right? How do, how do we realign, how do we align with the creator of the universe? First, recognizing and confessing who he is. And that doesn't change God, but it does change us. There's an old young life, a guy in Young Life years ago in suburban Chicago. It's back in 1988 or 89. He, he was doing a, 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 he was speaking at a church. It was a Willow Creek offshoot called Ginger Creek. And it was in a theater in suburban Chicago, a movie theater. And he stood up and this is how he started his message. One day, each of us will realize that yes, indeed, there is a God and I'm not it. That's what God is communicating to us. There's a God, a creator of all, that by his very word, you woke up this morning. The fact that you're continuing to breathe today is because God is continuing to utter the word breathe. The fact that you can think, it's because God has given you the mind to do so. And if you ever think about God and it's right, it's correct, it's because God has given you that thought, because he tells us in the scriptures that we, no one seeks God, but God first seeks us. And it's not that we loved him, it's that he loves us. So isn't it wise, doesn't it sound wise as a Christian to want to connect with, to love the Lord our God? So let me give you just a couple of ideas. You know what, you know the things that are going to be said. Read the Bible, go to church, pray. At a, John Grotenheis was a, one of my youth group kids in, at Heart Awake, and, and he, that was his answer to every question we brought up. Read the Bible, go to church, pray. Read the Bible, go to church, pray. Read the Bible, go to church, pray. Because that's what everyone tells everyone. Do that. It's wise. But there's some other ways, if, if those things aren't, if they're dry right now, if, they're, if, if you're reading the scriptures and it's just like, I've, I've heard this before. It doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel alive, even though the scripture tells us that it's living and active. And it, will, it, will, it will pierce the heart. It will divide spirit and soul. But sometimes prayer feels dry. There's a, um, I got to remember his name now. He wrote Reaching for the Invisible God, Philip Yancey. He quotes the, the passage that many of us love, that those who trust in the Lord will rise up on wings as eagles, will run and not grow weary, will, will walk and not go faint. And then he goes, isn't that backwards? Shouldn't it be walk, run, fly? But he's like, no, sometimes you, you're, you're flying, you're soaring, everything's going good, and then something shoots you down. You're like, all right, I got to keep going. And then, then I'm just, I just got to keep, I just got to keep moving. Sometimes life gets hard. Sometimes the world around you just pummels on you. And when you do go to God and you're saying, God, I know who you are, it doesn't seem to change anything. 
And you read the scriptures, and you're like, I didn't find any hope in that. Here's some things to try. Just some, some, some spiritual disciplines maybe to develop. One of them is fasting. What if you skipped a meal tomorrow, and every time you felt a hunger pain, you said to the Lord, I don't want to live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. What if you skipped, on Tuesday, you skipped two meals, and every time you felt it, every time your stomach starts making those weird noises, you know, those little gurgles, because it's used to, it's used to eating at that time? What if you said for this half hour that I would normally be eating lunch, Lord, I'm just going to sit and listen for what you might have to say? What if, instead of fasting, what if you decided to give up your favorite beverage for a week and just drank water and you remind yourself every time you drank water, you are God, the living water. And you tell me that if I drink of this water, I'll no, never grow thirsty again. And here's one that, that, that came, that was new to me, that came to me during the whole lockdown thing when I was the only one on this campus for about, well, me and Jim and Lori, but we were the only ones here for about 12 weeks. Very lonely, but had nothing left to say to God. I had prayed for God's healing on this planet. I had prayed for God's, uh, to, to, to relent and let, and take this, this pandemic away. And I just, this one, we were writing you daily devotional. Some, some of you might remember this little nugget, but I just had nothing. So I laid down on what I call my prayer couch because of the pain I have in my body. Um, th- sitting and praying doesn't usually work for me. And sometimes being prone, laying down is better. And sometimes I doze off. And then I wake up and I feel guilty. Now, let me just ask you to, to picture this for a minute. Those of you who have had children, or those of you who have grandchildren, or those of you who have great-grandchildren, if you're holding one of your children, you're sitting in your favorite chair and your favorite spot on the couch, and you're holding one of your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and they're telling you a story, and you know how those go. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, wait, what did I say? Oh, yeah, and then, it doesn't make any sense, but you're loving every minute of it. And they kind of doze off in the middle of a sentence. Are you going to go, wake up, how dare you disrespect me like that? Of course not. You're going to adore that child. And you might even very carefully stand up, even though it hurts your knees, and walk down the hall and place that child either on your bed with Um, pillows tucked under so that she or he can't roll over or put them in their crib. Why? Because you adore that child. And that child showed you no disrespect by telling you what that child wanted you to know, even if they were making it up on the spot, and then fell asleep in your arms. See, there are times when speaking to God is either unfruitful or unhelpful. There are times when you can just lay your head on the lap of God and say, I just want to be here for a moment. I'm not going to come with anything. I'm not going to come with any need. You already know all of those. I'm just going to lay my head in your lap and be. Who hasn't at one time or another, if you're in a marital relationship, just laid your head in the lap of your spouse. And they kind of rub on your head or scratch your scalp. or It's a very comforting thing. So if the spiritual disciplines of reading the scriptures, praying, and going to church right now just feel like they're just disciplines, try something new. Don't eat and ask God to fill you. Don't drink what you would normally drink and ask God to fill you. Or just lay your head in the lap of God, your Father, and say, I just want to be here with you now. You'll be amazed at either how quickly you might fall asleep or how new thoughts will come to mind, new comforts will come to my new reminders of how God has been there for you, with you, in you, and through you.
One of the ways we connect to God, one of the ways we love God is the same way you love a child, a grandchild, a great-grandchild, or a spouse. You spend time in their presence. And sometimes you use words, but sometimes you're just in each other's presence. And that might not feel like a spiritual discipline, but it is a way that God meets you. And if you want scripture for it, be still and know that I am God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Be still and know that I am God. Come to me if you're weary and heavily burdened. I'll give you rest. Take a day off every week. Be good for nothing. For what purpose? To know that God is God. Now, another sticky pages one, and I find this one very curious because it's, it's a combination of two things. But it's interesting where it starts. Now, this is we're moving, transitioning from trying to connect specifically with God to trying to connect specifically with one another. And one of the ways, this revolution that God, that Jesus, when, it, when he came, he, he, he basically, he said much, but he basically said to us and how we interact with other people is, don't do what comes natural to you. Don't seek revenge. Don't hold a grudge. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. He tells us to love one another, love your enemy, pray for those who harm you. It, it's an upside down, it, it seems upside down to us, but God, it, 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 we had turned the world upside down and we had cracked it. And he, he, he's just flipping it right, right side up and changing how we see not only one another, but we see ourselves. That we're not there to judge others. We're not here to, to get justice for ourselves. We're here to show the justice and the love and the mercy and the tenderness of God. This is from the, the book of Leviticus, and it's from uh, Leviticus 19, verse 18. It says, do not, this is where it starts, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, your God. Imagine what our world would look like today if every Christian on the planet decided to not hold a grudge, to not seek revenge, and to, when people are doing just that toward you, what if every Christian on the planet, I forgive you. If every time someone was canceled because of something they said 15 years ago, what if Christians sought them out and said, I'm with you. We might not believe the same things, we, not, we may not want the same things, but I will not remember you for who you were, and I will not remember you for what you've done. I will see you as God sees you today. Because you know, and I know, and we know for us that the old is gone, the new has come. When someone is in Christ, he's a whole new creation. The old, gone. What if God held a grudge? What if God held on to everything you've ever done, every thought you've ever had, every every? Every time you were selfish and didn't notice any time you were selfless. What if God treated us the way the world treats one another? See, that's what Jesus was coming to change. He wasn't worried about toppling Rome, although Rome did topple as a result in part, in large part, because of the Christian witness that was spreading across the, the world. But he wasn't coming to, 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 to flip over a kingdom of earth. He was coming to flip over a kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness says, when you connect with another person, if you don't get from them what you want, hate them. And Jesus says, if you're interacting with another person and you're not getting from them what you want, love them. Imagine what would happen if we, as we connect with God, we also connect with one another. And if you're wondering, people, a lot of people say this these days about things in scripture. They say, well, Jesus didn't even, he didn't talk about that. Well, yes, he did. He's a, number one, he's a member of the Trinity. Number two, he's the word of God. So all of the scriptures Jesus talked about, all of the scriptures he gave us. But look at what he said. And you know these stories. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember that one? When, when some teacher of the law, you know, Jesus, he asked Jesus, you know, what are the greatest commandments? And he says, love the Lord your God with everything you have. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. And then the guy goes, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story 
of a man beaten, left half naked and half dead on the side of the road, and a priest comes by, a Levite comes by, and they don't, they don't want to be dirtied up, and so they, it's inconvenient, it's messy, it's, it's probably dangerous, could be a trap, and they, they walk on by. But then the enemy of the guy that was asking the question, he came up and he actually cared for the man. He, he, he bandaged him up, he put him on his donkey, I, I don't remember if there's a donkey involved or not, but he took him off to an inn and he left money to be paid for, and he said, if, there, if, if, if it costs more than this, I'll come back by and I'll settle up later. And then Jesus asked the question, which of these three was a neighbor to the man left half dead? And the teacher could not even say Samaritan because Samaritans are enemies to the Jews. He said the one who showed mercy on him. See, Jesus is trying to turn the world right side up. As we connect with him, we connect with others. And as we connect with others, we behave toward them like God behaves toward us. Here's another story, another time, when one of the teachers of the law, this is from uh, Mark chapter 12, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The, there is no commandment greater than these. Well said, the te- or well said, teacher, the man replied, you were right in saying that, that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all of your heart with all of your understanding, with all of your strength, and and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So I think this man is earnestly seeking when he asked Jesus the question. Part of it is he wants to put his credentialing or credibility onto Jesus goes, that was a good answer. But then Jesus turns it on him again. Not in a negative way, but he says, you're, you're, you're close. You're getting there. Well, what about us? Are we close? Are we getting there? I can't answer for you. I can't answer for me. Most of the time, I would rather do what comes natural to me. Most of the time, I want to see someone who disagrees with me or who thinks that what I believe is, is foolishness, I want to see them as enemy. And even if they are my enemy, if they actually want harm to come to me, what does Jesus tell me to do? Love your enemy. What good is it to anyone if we love those who love us? Nothing. Even, even people who hate God do that. But if he came to revolutionize the world, if he came to transform not, not, just, not just civilizations, but what God's view of the world is should be the view that we have. If he came to change our worldview, and these are the things he told us. We know this back from Jonah, one of the oldest books in the Bible. When Jonah, God said, I want you to go there and tell them about me. Tell them to watch out, to stop what they're doing, and to change their ways. And he goes, uh-uh. So he runs away, and God, end, he ends up in the belly of a fish, and he gets, bleh. And you remember the end of that book? When Jonah, he had preached the gospel, and the people of Nineveh, which is modern-day Iraq, they had repented and changed, and Jonah's sitting on the, on the edge of the shore, and that, that, that tree was growing up over him, or that, that fig, whatever, and it withered, and he, and he cries out, and, he, and I summarize, but he says, I knew you were going to be faithful, merciful. He's angry with God because God is God. He's angry with God because God is showing who he is and that he even cares about who I see as my enemy. So if you want to connect with God, connect with God. Talk to him. Just spend time in his presence. Read what he tells you. That's how you get to know him. How do you love God? He'll tell you. And if the things that you've always done aren't working, start something new. Stop eating a meal or two. Drink something different. Because those are things we do all the time, and there's some pleasure that comes with them. But if the pleasure comes with them, 
leads us away or keeps us callous toward God, then change up what you, what, what the pleasures so that a newfound pleasure connecting with God arrives again. And it might take some time. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. And the people of God are told, go, go into every nation, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. When we connect with God, we must connect with others. And I'm going to, go so, I'm going to be so bold as to say, when we connect with others because of God, we are connecting with God. And you can see that model in the Ten Commandments. Vertical relationship, worldwide relationship, creation relationship, and then how we interact, how we don't interact with the world around us, with other people. God, creation, community. And you notice in Leviticus when God gives that command, he says, don't seek revenge don't bear a grudge. Love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? It might quite literally be the person that lives next to you or the person that lives across the street from you. And in the church, we've talked so much about our neighbor is out there that we forget that there's actually one right next door. There's one right across the street. There's one two doors down. And there's a great opportunity coming up to serve your neighbor. If you have it, snow blow their driveway. Or don't get mad at them because they're leaves. They didn't get them all up and they're blowing into your yard now. Maybe when you go out to get your leaves up that came from him, why don't you go next door and clean his up as well? I mean, these are simple little things. But imagine what the world would be if every Christian chose to do what God did by pursuing us. And we chose to serve others. We chose to love them in the name of Jesus. We chose to forgive those who want harm to come to us. What would happen to the world if we were revolutionaries like Jesus was? That if we're being hung on a cross, we can look up to God and say, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We cannot expect a people who don't know God to behave as if they did. But we can expect people who do know God to behave as if they do. God adores you. And he wants to be with you. He wants to spend time with your head in his lap. He wants to speak to you through his given, revealed word. He wants to hear from you through prayer. But he wants first for us to align ourselves so that we have ears to hear and eyes to see. And that is first telling God who he is. If you don't get any further than that, that's enough. But if you do tell God who he is, you do thank him for who he is. And then he begins to speak to you or bring to mind things that need confession or bring to mind thoughts about him. And you in turn to say to him, I I don't know what to do about my son. I don't know what to do about my neighbor. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. That's confession. I don't know, but I know the one who does. Imagine how your life would be different if you were in regular connection with God because he is waiting. And imagine how the world's life would be different If we, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, would clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and gentleness, forgiving whatever grievances we might have against one another and against others, imagine what would change in the world if Christians lived as if they were connected to the God who loves them. No one would be able to call a Christian a hypocrite. Because they would know one thing. Christians love. I'm not saying don't have thoughts. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't be involved. I'm not saying don't grieve when you see things that are happening. They're happening. But the only one that can take charge and change it 
is the one who loves you. He's the one that has the wisdom. He's the one that has the answers. He's the one that can set up kingdoms or take them down. We are his ambassadors. So if God is going to take down a kingdom or set one up, and people don't know what he's like, they're going to be scared. But if they do know what he's like because of what you're like, there's going to be hope. We actually have a responsibility to love the Lord our God with everything we have and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We're going to talk next week a bit about how you might connect with other people that you, don't, that you do know and that you don't yet know, or some that you have association with, but you might, it's kind of a, this is kind of how the relationship's been, and we're just going to leave it that way. What, what if you came with God's agenda? We'll talk more about that next week. Let's pray together. Lord, if my voice sounds, sounded passionate and frustrated, please let them know it's because I'm frustrated with myself. It's such an easy thing to know, and it's such a hard thing to do. Lord, remind us whose we are. And call us, give us a hunger and a thirst to seek you as you seek us. Remind us today and tomorrow and all week that you want to be with us. And give us the desire to want to be with you. And speak to us in our need. Give us rest. And Lord, as we have opportunity to interact with others, remind us how we should do that that we should do it like we're your children, that we should look like our Father, so that the world may know that our God is good. We pray this in Jesus' name, through the power of your Spirit, for the glory of God our Father. Amen.